Welcome, everyone. Kia ora ko Chris Glaudel toko Winawa. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive with Community Housing Aotearoa, and welcome to the uh, Accessible and Affordable Housing. And uh, it's great to see so many people with an interest here today, and great that you've spread out. This will be an active workshop. Uh, we'll start off uh, with a bit of speaking and then a bit of working. And so hopefully everybody's up for that and, and to bring your ideas, uh, your experiences, and your input and that will feed directly into some of the research that Dr. Bev James, our first speaker, uh, will be uh, uh, talking to you about. So uh, Bev has a PhD in sociology and extensive experience in local and central government uh, policy research and in consultancy roles, in addition to being uh, a fabulous person uh, and a, a trustee of the Marlboro Sustainable Housing Trust. And following that, Ratna Sharma uh, will speak and then I will uh, take the place of Tony Emmett with ADAPT, who unfortunately came down with COVID and isn't able to be here today. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to bring Bev up to get us started, and then uh, I'll come back in a few minutes. Ah, tēnā tātou katoa, ah, tēnā tātou e whānau, um, uh, tēnā tātou, um, he uh, kaupapa nui, o tēnē hui, um, mō te kāinga mahana, te kāinga manaki, me te kāinga uh, haumaru. Tēnā tātou katoa. Ko Bev James tōku ingwa. Um, I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, session today. I've got a couple of hats. That's uh, the reason why I'm here. So first of all, I do want to talk to you about a new research program that I'm part of, uh, and also very briefly um, to talk a little bit about our housing trust. But um, I'm going to hand over, after a short introduction, to Ratanesh and to Chris. But before I start, I'd just like to um, recommend to you this publication. Um, there's a few copies here uh, that have kindly been given to me to distribute by Yvonne Wilson, and it's Hekainga Pairawa Atu Mona Komatua. And it's a toolkit for the development of Komatua housing. So there are a few copies here, and um, if you need some more, um, I, can, I can get you in contact with Yvonne. It's a really good publication. So the research that I'm going to talk about has recently started, and what we are interested in is looking at um, what is the impact of accessible design on the affordability and the su supply of small homes? And we're defining small homes at about 40 to 70 um, square metres. So what is the minimum size that you can get down to and still have an accessible dwelling? Because we don't actually know that. We don't have that practical research, and this is what we're aiming to do. Um, and how can you make small dwellings affordable as well as functional and accessible? So, And we want to look at the costs and benefits of building affordable small dwellings. And also, how can the building industry and housing providers be encouraged? to build small, affordable homes with accessible design. So I not only have a research interest in this, and that's quite a long-standing interest because most of my research has been around affordable housing and housing for our ageing population. I also have a very practical interest in this as the chair of the Marlborough Sustainable Housing Trust. So all we aim that all of our stock is actually accessible to a certain degree, whether it's um, a life mark accredited um, or it has other accessibility features. So that is our aim. 
just talking about the research a little bit more. So what we're going to do is firstly to assess the cost of accessible design for small homes. And we're going to look at diff this across different typologies. So standalone uh, duplexes and multi-units. Um, we're going to look at, get some plans. We've already started to um, identify a number of plans, existing plans, uh, and look at those and how they might suit different households. So, for example, um, households, uh, an older person or um, a, a young disabled person or a young mother with small children, for example. Um, and we're going to test those also with designers and housing providers. Uh, and also part of the research is to look at how we increase the take up of accessible design. Um, we have an estimate of the percentage of New Zealand's current stock that is accessible. And that percentage is 2%. So just have a think about that. The whole point of doing this is because it's really important that people have homes that they can live in safely. And that also how important housing security is for people. And part of housing security is not just about affordability, or about tenure security. It's also about whether you can physically live in that home. Um, I've personally talked with families who have to carry their disabled child upstairs. Um, talked with uh, parents who cannot access the whole of their house. So how do they actually support their children? Um, talked with older people who are in uh, who in their bathroom have a shub. Anyone know what a shub is? Yeah. Um, so, and many of our smaller dwellings were built with shubs. Uh, you know, sort of like forty odd years ago. So, this is the sort of thing that actually threatens people's housing security because they, they cannot literally live comfortably and safely in their homes. Um, and we're talking about lifelong benefits. This is not just something for uh, a, a person in, in their later years. This is really, really important right, right through uh, what we call the life cycle um, of our lives, is to get our houses that actually we can move in and out of easily um, and that the house does the things that we want and need it to do. Um, it's all about independence as well. And also, um, this morning I heard that word stigmatisation. Now that's another thing that um, people who need maybe home mods, home modifications, um, or there's something about their house that doesn't work for them, particularly if they're renters. They're really, really reluctant to raise this with the landlord. They feel stigmatised. Um, you know, people have said to me, oh, I would never ask my landlord for a grab rail um, because they essentially they might terminate my tenancy or they might yeah they might do uh, a modification but then my rent will go up so again we have that stigmatizing um, aspect of design so um, people who are working in the area of accessible design universal design are really aware of that and they're working to make those designs desirable, um, beautiful. And that's something that we're really aware of as well. Um, in fact, I have seen some group home builders who offer accessible features in their house plans for a premium. Now that tells you something about the changing mindset around that as well. Sorry, I'm really 
probably raving on a bit much, but um, <laughs> how do we compare? Well, uh, one estimate is 2% of our housing stock is uh, accessible in New Zealand at the moment. Um, it's not included in the residential building legislation or the building code, okay? That is really a major, major problem. The only um, accessible standards are around public housing. I know you all know this because I can see you nodding. So we don't meet the obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, there is some recognition. The Ministry of Housing and Urban Development has recently um, put out their long-term insights brief briefing on housing and the ageing population, and they acknowledge that this is a problem. Ministry of Building, Innovation and Employment, I don't know what it is, the MB, um, <laughs> is reviewing building accessibility. Um, I've actually attended a couple of uh, meetings with them about this. Their main focus is still on public buildings. However, again, they are acknowledging they're going to be looking at the private uh, residential stock as well. Other countries have accessibility standards for new residential buildings. So my question is, why don't we? We have, however, New Zealand's life mark. Um, you're no doubt very familiar with that. Um, it's, a, it's a charitable organisation. It uh, advocates very strongly for universal design. It's won awards internationally and it has um, a system of standards and you, you can get your plans checked by LifeMark. They're lovely people and very helpful. Um, so there are... I think my, my perception is that chips are turning to building accessible stock. There are some chips that have obviously been in that area for a very long time. Obviously, um, accessible properties is one example, but increasingly um, my perception is that chips are looking at um, increasing the, uh, the numbers of accessible stock, <clears throat> including for two stories. Um, however, there are a number of bar barriers, challenges, impediments, whatever you want to call them. Um, and these are, I've just very quickly listed them here. Um, things like industry relationships, designs and processes and how they interact. Uh, whether or not you can get the materials and products easily and are they easy to use? Uh, what is the industry knowledge and capability? Uh, the role of consumers and householders, their knowledge, what access do they have to impartial information about what's available and what's possible. Um, planning and building consent requirements. I can go on a lot about uh, level entry and uh, planning rules around that, but I won't. Um, also, you know, what are the increased costs? They're not huge but there may be some increased costs due to accessible features. How is that actually um, accommodated within the, the pricing structures that, that chips and developers use? And then we've got what is the optimal mi um, mix, regulation, incentives and voluntary standards? All jurisdictions that have uh, introduced accessibility standards as mandatory have that as a question. You know, uh, I, my personal view is that regulation is necessary but not sufficient. So you need to look right across uh, regulation incentives and voluntary standards. There we are. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I also have at the end, we'll just whip back and we've got some examples of uh, some plans as well. And Ratanesh and Chris uh, will be providing some plans as well. But thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Bev. A great introduction. And I think it, very exciting research. And the best part, it's going to be done next year at this time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
so it's not something that, that has a long lead in. So the feedback, the information that you provide today is going to feed directly into that and then potentially follow up conversations can, can come from that. And I think it really lays out the, you know, some of the issues that we're facing. And for us at Community Housing Aotearoa, and we know our members are trying to incorporate this, we have the public housing design guides that encourage, uh, but the funding model really doesn't require nor incentivize that. And I think it's an area that increasingly we see members trying to address, and this will help to make better informed decisions and also inform government of, of what may need to change both regular and the regulatory framework, but also in the funding and finance framework, not just for community housing providers, because uh, we will never be the housing provider for all New Zealanders who face the, these types of issues, and that's why it really needs to be at that regulatory system, the building uh, code level. Uh, with that bit of, of editorial comment, I want to introduce Ratnesh Sharma. Ratnesh is the general manager for Homes of Choice New Zealand. He's a property professional with a degree in property from Auckland University and over 20 years experience uh, working across both residential and commercial property um, leading development projects, facilities management, and prior to his current role was with uh, Airedale Property Trust, LifeWise. So, Ratnesh, please come up. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I am indeed humbled to be here in this room and to share uh, some of the learnings uh, and also to uh, sh uh, discuss some of the issues that uh, we face uh, in the industry. Um, thank you. So um, the topic that I have uh, for discussion today is why is specialized disability housing matters? Well, of course, we are here in this conference and housing does really matter. But how about this cohort or group of people? that are disabled. Uh, and a brief uh, about Homes of Choice, uh, where I'm currently uh, working. Homes of Choice is a specialized disability housing provider, and uh, we support people with uh, intellectual, physical, vision impaired, hearing impairment, and learning disabilities. We manage over 150 uh, properties, mostly group homes. Respite homes, we got about 11 respite homes, and uh, about 10 uh, supported independent living units. Uh, through our respite home, on average over a year, nearly 500 people go through our respite homes. And uh, we, in our group homes, we support around 450 people. We have a very huge and a diverse uh, workforce, and we belong to the Spectrum group. Um, we, of this, we own 104 properties and lease around 46 properties from supported housing unit Kainga Ora and uh, from private sector as well. Uh, the issue with the group home model is that there is no independence. There is no independence, it's a group home, it's a group setting. And uh, the other thing that I've quickly learned is that there are many parents that even they don't bother registering on the housing list with the family member with disability. And they feel it is for them to uh, take care of their own family members. So that was something, uh, and I think on that note, that's why we need to look into specialized disability housing and giving them independence as well. So a bit of a background, uh, one in five New Zealanders is disabled. That's around 1.1 million people, some sort of disability. Housing needs vary according to the nature and impact of the disability. The existing public housing policies and building codes that BEF have touched on does not meet the specialized needs of this population. New Zealand has, a, has no separate funding model for the design and development of specialized disability housing. Public housing, including accessible housing, is funded through Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. And modification is common terminology for accessible housing. 
In New Zealand, this funding is fragmented through ACC, District Health Boards, now via Tefa Tuora, Ministry of Health, now via Faikaha, Ministry of Disabled People, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, and Ministry of Social Development. If you compare that in, in Australia, funding of um, housing development or the specialized disability housing and wraparound support is centralized through National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS. The disability housing funding model. We do have what we have been listening to today, uh, this morning, we do have a funding model, but it's all one or the same uh, funding that applies to the specialized disability housing sector as well, and that is through MHUD. Disability housing development can be accessed through this funding. My experience in looking at the application form that we have now, there is a special consideration for accessible housing, and applications with accessibility are considered favorably. That least has been my experience, uh, and I will talk about some of our projects uh, to date. However, the following uh, funding challenges remain. HUD funding is an operating supplement, and there is hardly any capital funding. HUD funding does not cover for provision of space for communal care, and that is needed by the sector. The HUD funding model is not continuous, and therefore the community housing sector is not able to gear up for long-term investment. Again, uh, on legislation and accessibility, and I'm going to repeat on that, um, the building codes and what could be done differently, and I know, and Bev has touched on that as well, is I hope there is a review by MIMBI on this, and it will be good to uh, get accessibility into residential design as well. However, a legislative, legislative change would be required to introduce accessibility requirements or age-friendly features such as universal design, for private residential buildings. These changes would have significant implications for the construction and housing market and potentially affect all owners. So homes of choice and some of our projects. Homes of choice is part of Spectrum Foundation and is a registered community housing provider specializing within the disability sector. Many of our customers have high and complex needs and require a specialized living environment. And I've shared that the clients that we serve or we work with. So what we have done, we in New Zealand have this universal uh, design standard. But for us and the clientele that, we, that I have just uh, discussed that we work with, we needed something more than that. So Homes of Choice has developed its own design guide. And the initial idea was to share this design guide with our contractors, maintenance contractors, if we are trying to upgrade a kitchen or a bathroom. And now this design guide is also used by our architects and builders for the design that we want. And recently I have learned that it has, this design guide has taken a step further and is now part of the specification for our new building consent. So that's the education it does with the architects as well as council. So within this design guide, we have, we have uh, categorized uh, our housing in four categories. And the first one is improved livability. Housing designed to improve li livability by incorporating a reasonable level of physical access and enhance provision for people with sensory, intellectual, or cognitive impairment. The second category is fully accessible, housing designed to incorporate a high level of physical access for people with significant physical impairment. And the fourth category is called a robust design, which is basically strengthen walls, higher ceilings, concealed uh, uh, sprinkler systems, and so forth. And the last category is high physical support, which is uh, also respite homes. So there is, that's our housing, uh, you know, there could be questions around, can all that be incorporated? It all comes down to the cost. And if it's a respite home, we have, um, you know, the, the hoist and, uh, and the structural and all that adds to the cost. Hawk development projects, I think I'll share a bit of our 
housing projects and what we are doing in this space. Currently, we have uh, following specialized disability housing development projects at various stages. Uh, the first three projects that we see there are, are funded under operating supplement, IRRS uh, funding model. And the, 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 from number four to number seven, from 41 Bula to 41 Pitt Street, they are funded under affordable housing funding model. So we are one of those successful uh, chip that have secured funding under the uh, affordable housing funding. So those are our seven projects at this stage, a total of 27 units that will add 64 bedrooms. I think the important bit here is um, most of them are one and two bedroom, except the bigger ones where we have four bedrooms, where the, uh, which I will show some drawings and, and discuss about that as well. This is an example of a independent supported living option. There in this here, we have five times one bedroom unit and there is a communal area. And that's the discussion that I'm having with Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, that that communal, why that communal area is needed. And uh, so that it is not a no, but it, again, it is all that uh, work that needs to happen in the background for us to succeed and convince that why this needs to be funded and even the communal area needs to be funded. Um, this is our another project, and again, uh, under operating supplement funding. Total of uh, six unit, three units in ground floor are fully accessible and the units upstairs are um, robust designed. And uh, this is just an example of another project. Uh, two, two units, one of one bedroom and one of two bedroom. Uh, this is fully accessible design. Uh, probably we can learn some in terms of floor area, how much, I mean, uh, uh, these designs do give me some numbers, you know, whether you are able to get a one bedroom fully accessible unit in 53 square meter, or it depends how much freely you want to move within your bedroom. If you want somebody in a wheelchair to fully, freely move, uh, both, you know, both sides of your bed and have, and that have, uh, f you can flow freely, then I would say would be somewhere around 60 to 63 square meter. But you know, it depends upon what you want, but you can also achieve probably around something around, uh, I would say around 50, 53 square meter, uh, but there will be uh, in that probably this bit of uh, limitation. It, it comes down to how far do we want to go? And so this is a project under the affordable housing funded project uh, in Howick. And something, one learning I had from this project was that the changing the planning rules on this size, we could have developed six to eight units. But when we did our stakeholder engagement and went to speak to the uh, special school principal in that area, he told me, Ratnesh, less is more. And so, and so I really pulled that back and just planning to build three units because this is three times two bedroom for, for uh, with high and complex need uh, children and probably living with parents or a single mom or whatever. So that's, that's this design for. So we specifically build f knowing whom we are building for. And uh, probably another project. This is again under affordable housing fun funded project in, in Henderson, three times one bedroom. This is a uh, bit different, the ground floor of the four bedroom unit is fully accessible and there is one bedroom downstairs. So that means a family can live together if there is a person with disabilities. To conclude, current universal design may not be suitable solution for all disability housing needs. Specialized housing designs and centralized funding incorporating market rent that takes into consideration specialized design because there is a cost to specialized design will better save the need of the disabled community. While public housing policy 
is changing and new initiatives are being beginning to enable independent li uh, living independent living significant gap remains for this reason we depend on costly modification when this should be considered during the design phase i think the challenge that uh, is for the sector if we are, we are building um, affordable housing social housing public housing whatever you call but if we can incorporate two simple things such as wider entrance and if we can have accessible bathroom i think that will allow a neighbor to f come freely into your home and have that community sense of feeling got it so what does success looks like uh, legislative change is required to introduce accessibility requirements as is in other of some of the other OECD countries and to include age-friendly features such as universal design for uh, private residential buildings. Regulatory reforms is required to deliver basic infra infrastructure even within high density setting. We'll assist vulnerable communities in being fully integrated. A centralized funding model is required as well for the design and development of a specialized disability housing. Thank you. Were there any questions at this point for Ratnesh? It's not, we'll, have, we'll have a chance. Oh, yes, please. Sherry from Homes for People, just wrestling with um, um, all the different factors of how much we should consider accessible design, whether it's in all our homes, some of our homes. Um, you used the statistic that only 2% at the moment are accessible and one in five has a disability. But then I hear from you, Ratnesh, that um, a disability is very varied and sometimes we need robust, sometimes we need accessible. Do you have any sort of feeling of what the percentage of the community would need that, that sort of significant physical disability accessible design? Any stats out there? Um, yeah, th this uh, I, I can understand where you're coming from with that because it's it's uh, often quite helpful to have a percentage. So then you can say um, we'll do this percentage of housing, which will be for say wheelchair users, for example. Um, and there are are disability prevalence statistics available for New Zealand. I don't have them in my head at the moment. However, the whole point of universal design is that through through the life cycle, people are able to operate within their homes. Um, and the, there's also um, the, the, you need to think about uh, people may be okay at the moment, but we can all be in a position where temporarily or permanently we, may, we need those accessible features in a home. Um, one way of looking at this is to um, look at the, your, your housing as providing a basic universal level of accessibility, which is probably about life mark three. Um, uh, and uh, it's sometimes called visitability in other jurisdictions. Um, we cannot design, well, I I'm personally don't think you can design a house to cater for all types of disability and expect that to operate across the board. But if you build in some of the uh, future proofing into a house that's in a much better position if a higher level of, of um, um, uh, if functionality is needed. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, okay, I can understand why people want to put a percentage on it, but I'm not sure that's the most cost effective way to go with this. We should be looking at um, what, what can we do within our stock that is, um, makes it much more usable than it is at the moment. I mean, for example, things like um, making sure that toilets and bathrooms have reinforced um, walls so you can retrofit um, 
decent grab rails. Uh, I've seen people with stick-on rails. I mean, that's really unsafe. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just to add to that, probably a good uh, a starting point is what uh, Research Kangaora did, and they have a target of 15%, uh, and probably that's a good starting point. I think uh, that is based on a research that they did with their, in, with their uh, uh, clients. And um, you're correct in that we have a uh, target of 15% full universal design for our homes. And uh, we don't have a specific target for accessibility. The numbers I saw suggested 11% of our customers identify as having a disability. But that may well be under-reporting because they're concerned if they ask for it, they'll fall down the list. Um, but my, my main comment here is... It's, we're not finding, it's not that difficult to design the home for what we term full universal design. The issue is the site. Um, we're finding, for example, in Christchurch, it's very easy to deliver 15% full universal design because it's pretty flat. Um, in Wellington, it's a different question altogether. It's not just the level access, it's the access to the car park. It's those other issues that make it far more difficult for us anyway to deliver 15%. Uh, Yeah, and I just respond to that. I think I totally agree with that because one of the design that was that I uh, presented there, just to get accessibility feature, and just to get the levels right or the gradient right, there was additional cost of around ninety thousand just by put a retaining wall and a and a car park so that you can have level entry. So it adds to the cost. It does. Hi, um, I'm Karina Somerville from the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust. Um, so this is something that we're working on at the moment. We have a lot of development underway currently. Um, we had an experience recently where we built an accessible three bedroom home, um, but then we didn't have anyone who really needed it. And in fact, the accessible bathroom put some people off. So we've realized that actually, while we want to aim for a certain percentage of accessible homes, we need to know um, more about who in our community is needing these and exactly what they need so that we can tailor it because it is an additional expense. Um, I'm really struggling to find information on the people in our local community that have a need and what that need might be. I've reached out to social workers and different disability um, organisations and I just can't find any clear source of data for who in my community is possibly flying under the radar and we need to be connected with. I don't know if you have any information on that. Um, just a couple of suggestions. The, um, the DHB and the needs assessment, have you talked to them? Um, because they d deal with all ages. And the other one is I've actually found that private sector property managers, particularly uh, if you've got a large one who uh, that looks after a lot of stock, um, they often uh, come across people who need accessible housing, but they usually can't supply it. So that's just a couple of suggestions off the top of my head. Any other questions before we hit the next uh, section? Yes. Uh, not so much a question, but just a suggestion. There is a um, spinal cord injury register that has um, levels of disability, uh, SCIR New Zealand, I think. I'm not sure the percentage off the top of my head, but it's got a lot of good data on there. Um, John O'Brien from Accessible Properties. Um, just wondering, we're finding that the under the MB design guidelines, our fire requirements are really increasing the costs. I just wondered how you've been handling that through your developments. Yes, that's a, 
that's a uh, difficult one and an interesting one as well. And I think um, for the sector, for the disability sector, and in reference to the NDIS design guide, all NDIS homes in Australia, if you compare, they have a domestic fire and sprinkler system installed. I think we are really behind in that as a sector, not only the disability sector, but the community housing sector. I think personally that is a good investment. It is not a requirement of the building consent or the building act, but I th depending upon the client that we are serving, then we should be. And in the case of the developments that I am doing with Homes of Choice, I've included that in the build cost and negotiated that with HUD to fund that. You refund. Oh, that's gone. We're finding as the people in our homes, these are group homes, are ageing and their needs are increasing. The the requirements are changing. It's becoming very cost prohibitive, um, particularly to try and reach for existing homes. But on the newer homes we're building to, it's adding a big cost to it. Um, it's basically going all the way up to spring, um, putting sprinklers in um, or, or and the fire cells. Thank you. Uh, and, and just in that reference, I think it is important to note that the community housing sector engaged extensively with MB around the fire de design guide, and there is a pathway that's made it easier than it otherwise would have been. But to note, it's something that if you are looking at developing this type of housing, you should understand and make sure you have a good fire engineer in early to help you through that process. And certainly Rutnash, accessible properties, community housing can provide you with that resource. And it's also, I think, buried on MB's website also. Um, and now I'm going to, to try to channel Tony Abbott uh, Tony Evan, and go through uh, quickly a presentation from uh, ADAPT. And uh, ADAPT is a, a newer member of Community Housing Aotearoa and works to, to provide housing for persons with intellectual disabilities. And um, you know, where they're at and, and what we've heard is that, you know, 20% requiring some kind of support and, and thinking about what type of assistance uh, is needed, how that may change over time. And also to remember that a, a lot of the people that are experiencing disability are not seniors, they're, they're younger uh, and it can affect anyone at any stage of their life. And so when you're thinking about accessibility, to think more broadly about who it is and to realize that um, uh, the best solution, as was talked about, is one that can serve anyone at, at different stages in the life cycle. So their trust got on this track as a provider for housing, uh, people living in assisted care, working with a service provider to understand the fundamental challenges that they face in providing good homes. And, and many people are placed into a flatting situation and really looking at their their experience within that situation and how it's working or not working uh, for people. And when they are put together at times that flatting situation could, could cause some discord, people trying to negotiate how they live together. And then a, a support care then is instead of uh, working on positives of, of getting people out into the community, having experiences, uh, supporting their personal needs, social engagements, or, or working with those interpersonal engagements and, and spending you know time uh, that doesn't allow them to provide the other types of support. So that was one of their drivers. And it was working with the Supported Lifestyle Horaki Trust uh, that they started to do a really a deep dive into understanding uh, how to incorporate universal design and how to apply that to a lot of different environments. And what they found through the research is that the, you know, the applications in a home environment in, are targeted towards the elderly and physical disabilities rather, rather than those with other types of disabilities. And they felt the need to, to add to the pool of knowledge about what's out there and looking at persons that had uh, sensitivities in the building elements that relate to sight, touch, sound, and, and other sensory stimulants, and uh, things that other people may not find a, as, a, as a problem within their home environment, but for many others can make life extremely uncomfortable, and how could they bring design that address those types of needs? And so they worked with their partners, and uh, a few of them on the list there, 
uh, Ignite and Buffer Miskel in the design uh, space uh, con uh, construction company and then also their supported lifestyle, the service provider, to get the insights and talking with the individuals, the home, looking at the homes, meeting with the carers to understand what types of outcomes and, and changes could be made. And then they looked at it holistically and looked for a, a solution that could be used by as many as possible. And they felt that it was important to really to establish the learnings in a modular fashion so that it could be easily reapplied. And looking at that, say whether you're a homeowner that needs to build a single unit, a developer who's looking at a larger, highly efficient housing block, and then working with Ignite and Buffa Miskel uh, to create uh, a set of adapt design principles it's not necessarily you know detailed drawings but the principles that you need to consider and work with your design team and for adapt it's been particularly relevant uh, to also think about uh, how one home or multiple homes work together in a bigger context of the community and it was through this that the neighborhood living concept was developed and you, you'll see why some unique ideas around not only creating accessibility for exterior areas but also how they've incorporated different housing modules into the greater community and so they they kind of start from a uni, universal design and those principles have remained at the core of the work that they've done and you know making those life mark standards part of the concept from the start leads to spaces that intuitively work um, as well as looking good and when it's done properly, it's a home for life and that anyone would be proud to live in and really set with an environment that, that is supportive and including those additional sensory details. So looking at soundproofing, uh, where color contrast is needed or not, uh, lighting that has, has been another key as aspect where they've looked into where natural light needs to be supported by dimmable internal lighting plans and how all of those components both support people with different abilities and also improve the home overall. As they've looked to the the outside and working with the landscape architects at Buffett Miskel, they created a privacy gradient that's shown here and the goal was set to to set up a community so that people can make independent decisions as they move through the space as to how private or social they wish to be. Uh, without necessarily requiring the support of a carer. And then by designing small gathering points for smaller groups, landscaping with plantings to create soft boundaries, as well as having alternative routes for getting around the site, it offers choices uh, that seek to create an intuitive experience. And then uh, applying the privacy gradient to a, a complete neighborhood living concept and see how things come together at that level, looking not just at a single, but a group of homes. And uh, for this setup, the, their goal was to create 14 one and two bedroom homes uh, with a shared hub of, with outdoor space and a connection to the greater community while still blending in with the standard New Zealand subdivision. And so a little more in terms of the, the homes themselves. And what they showed is, through their research that individual homes are the preferred solution for most people is it, it gives the people the privacy that they crave and resolves a lot of the issues that come out of an, an unnatural flatting situation. Um, that said, they also identified that terraced homes are not always the most suitable way uh, to blend different communities together. So they've designed a, a three to four unit per roof model uh, where everyone has their own private outdoor space and a front door. I think similar to one de design that, that Ratnesh had showed from Homes of Choice. And to the outside world, it looks like a standard single family home. Um, dream scenario, maybe? Uh, but it, it does show what's possible and, and different ways to look at it. And then uh, they have come up with um, uh, modular accessible floor plans that were designed by Ignite. And these are an example of a few of the key elements they've considered that, that most plans might not, such as there's a direct line and cavity slider between the bed and the ensuite uh, with ceiling infrastructure built in that makes it possible to install a hoist in the future. Um, by removing hallways, they've reduced cost, and when combined with the cavity sliders, they've created more open space. And the two-bedroom plan uh, features two different layouts for different relationship or care needs, where someone may have a, a live-in carer with them. And then applying their 
uh, neighborhood living guides that go in to break down the design considerations for each individual room in the home. And it's a living document. They're still working through and creating it, looking for more input. Um, and one of their key roles is, is to really um, advocate for the needs of people with different abilities. Uh, and they're always available to work with any agency to share uh, this information and other insights that they've learned. And finally, really wanting to, to really reinforce that this housing is needed and, and it's here in a housing discussion, but it's also a, a service provision discussion. And today there are too many people living in housing situations that are far from ideal. People are either isolated from their community or social interaction is something that they cannot escape from. And in both scenarios, people need help or support so they can meet their basic needs outside of their actual home. And this is just going through the components of the of the design guide. Um, and it, it not only makes sense, but it has a, a large financial cost associated to it when they're not in the right environment. And so really looking at changes over time and adaptability is, is very important. And it's really, you know, creating those spaces, that living environment so that people have the choice and have the level of support and care that they need within their home, within a neighborhood that's integrated. So they're trying to turn that concept into a reality and they've got a, a site in Pairoa that they've begun working on and this is design layout for that incorporating their neighborhood living design and the elements of the homes that they've uh, that they've put forward and so uh, it's on the site of the old Pairoa race course if anybody knows that site I have no idea um, and they're looking forward to developing that and and providing those new homes. So I hope I've done at least some justice to, to Tony and ADAPT's work in this space. And if you go to their website, you, know, you can contact them directly and also find the information on their, on their guide. And with that, I will turn it back over to Bev. Uh, we very, um, were able to uh, get some other designs from accessible properties for a proposed development in Hamilton. And we just wanted to quickly show you those as well. Um, so thank you very much, Accessible Properties. Um, I just got a few, shows you the, um, the typology there. This is a one bedroom unit, just over 50 square metres. Um, you can see the circles there um, for circulation. Uh, also the widened doorways um, and entranceway and um, the living areas are very uh, open. And then this is a two bedroom unit, uh, just um, uh, 73.7 square metres. So again, that very um, accessible design. So, and we've already seen a number of other um, designs through the presentations. So what we were just hoping to do, um, we've only got about, yeah, 10, 10 minutes <laughs> uh, left is really just to throw it open because I'm sure there's uh, a lot of experience here in the room and I've just taken the liberty of um, uh, um, just a few questions not that we have to uh, rigorously go through these but this project, uh, I should have also said that this is funded through the Building Better Homes, Towns and Cities National Science Challenge. So we've just uh, started it a, a month or so ago and it's running um, until next April. What we're looking to do is, to, um, my particular role in it, and I'm working with a number of colleagues on this, is to find out about from CHIP's perspectives, um, to what extent um, they're looking at building or have built um, uh, accessible designed homes in the small homes category. 
Um, and what has worked in that process? Um, what hasn't worked and have some elements of accessible design been easy to achieve or to incorporate? But are there things that are quite difficult? I mean, I, I know from our experience and our trust what we've found easy and what we've found hard, but um, you know, your experience might be quite different. And how has it been to um, the process of working through with designers, um, builders, developers, um, about when you raise accessible design, um, the sorts of objectives you have in that area, or what your design standards are, and how uh, how is that received by the various um, professions and uh, trades that you work with? Um, and also, would you like to, or have you intended to use accessible design, but for various reasons that hasn't come off, hasn't been viable, um, or it, it just hasn't been possible, and why was that? So those are the sorts of things I'm really interested in, um, and I'm very happy um, uh, I'm here tomorrow um, as well. If you want to have a quick chat, um, I'd be really happy to have a have a talk about these uh, issues with you. So I really appreciate um, any any feedback. But if we've got a few minutes now, uh, if people want to comment on their experiences with incorporating accessible design, that'd be great. Thank you. Fiona Matthews from Salvation Army. Um, what I find is that you have to be intentional about the accessibility from the beginning of your development. So um, when we've uh, talked to our architects and construction, um, uh, got together with the civils, et cetera, we've been quite intentional about what we're uh, doing. So, um, for example, three bedroom, uh, four bedroom properties, uh, that you have a bedroom down the bottom with um, uh, ensuite bathroom, which is your second bathroom. Um, not the one with the bath in it that HUD um, require, but the one that has an accessible shower. Those kind of things. Yes, there are difficulties with level entry. Um, and even when you've got the most flat looking site, it's not flat. Um, so that's that's been an issue. Um, but most architects will get on board with with that. Um, but I think you need to be intentional and, and kind of hold your line and hold your line with HUD in terms of the funding as well. Thanks. Um, again, I'm uh, with Kangor and uh, we're now more engaged in building apartments than we are in uh, single family homes or um, just because we're trying to increase urban densities and uh, we're often taking out one or two um, single family homes and putting in things like what we call a three level walk up, which is uh, six apartments over two, over three levels uh, with a central staircase. Now, one of the problems we come across is you can make the ground floor units um, fully universal design or accessible, uh, but that may, typically ends up with a larger footprint, which you then would typically have to repeat on the upper floors. So you end up building more area uh, for no reason because the upper floors are not accessible. Um, so that's becoming a bit of a headache for us. And... Um, when building apartments, particularly the high rise apartments, when we start putting in lifts, you'd think it would be easy then to put um, uh, accessible or uh, units on the upper floors. Uh, the problem with that is you have to be able to evacuate people from those upper floors in the event of a fire. And you have to file a evacuation plan that has to be approved by FENS. And if you haven't spent the money on a fire lift, which is a quite an expensive piece of kit, you can't use the lift to evacuate your customers. And FENS don't want to do it. So you have to somehow have a plan where some of your other customers would help any uh, disabled or mobility impaired people uh, getting out of the building, which from our point of view is really not doable because of our customer base. Um, it's, we wouldn't have a reliable set of uh, people to do that. So it's quite a, a barrier to building sufficient accessible units, certainly above the ground floor. <clears throat> Other comments? Yeah. So up until recently, Homes for People has been an unfunded for 
affordable housing. So very much, you know, making the finances work has been important. Um, we set out deciding that we'd do 50% of our small homes, which are all in the 50 to sort of 73 square metre range. We thought we'd do half of them as what we call disability friendly. So they're not level entry because there's a whole lot of issues with that. But you can put a little foam wedge and um, then you can make them reasonably accessible and we're doing half wet floor showers. More recently we've decided apparently you can make the concrete so that it's easy to modify to a wet floor shower later, but put a normal shower box, avoiding the people who don't actually want a wet floor shower, but say, you know, 20 years time they need one. It's not such a drama because the concrete's ready to go, but you're happy to talk more about that. I don't think we're quite intentional enough. One of our sites like wet floor showers, but then I'm not sure if the doorways were quite wide enough on another one, wet floor shower, but then we realised that the, the architects appear, I don't know to any architects, mostly to work in T2D. So like the walk, it wasn't a, there's no, no off street parking and the walkway up was really too steep. So, so ah, but it's still an age in place available unit. So yeah, ch challenges and yeah, I think the intentionality is really important. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jo from Habitat for Humanity, Nelson. Uh, so we're just finishing a development at the moment and we have, again, it's that intentional requirement that is so necessary. A um, couple of one-bed um, units, Bev, they're 54 square metres. Um, and I think probably the challenge is also deciding how far you want to go. So we've generally stuck to about a life mark four as a minimum. Um, with one going just a little bit further, full commercial vinyl right the way through, as opposed to mixing a couple of uh, flooring surfaces, a few minor adjustments like that to to provide a couple of different levels. But it is very much about the intention um, and have certainly found our architect 100% on board. Um, the levels are always fun and the uh, expense of creating that level entry access um, can get a bit interesting, but uh, yeah, it is all about that intentionality. Just one more comment. Um, because we're building for sale to first home buyers, um, now potentially progressive homeowners, which is awesome, um, a lot of the inquiries we get for needing accessible homes, just thinking of you at Queenstown Lakes, they're not in a position to achieve home ownership probably ever. So then there's a real funding issue and really it comes back to social housing, which of course is still a bit few and far between in our region. Other, question, other questions or comments? I guess for folks that, that have leave the, the workshop and think of something later, this is research is going on over the next year. How might folks stay engaged with this or if they have other ideas, what's the best way to... Uh, Email on there, I hope. <laughs> Bev at bevjames.nz. Easy. <laughs> and then often uh, through the Community Housing Ontario, a newsletter, as research updates and things come through, uh, you might be able to, to see and, and connect in later as, as the research progresses and other questions arise or, or other information becomes available. Were there any other questions, comments from the floor? Yeah. Um, we have quite a struggle in really defining what is fit for purpose because it depends on who your clientele are. And what we're noticing, particularly in our, um, what we call our IHC portfolio, which is for the people with intellectual disabilities, who um, many of the clients are aging, and while some of the houses we would have thought were fully accessible, um, you've got many different sizes now in wheelchairs, particularly electric wheelchairs. Um, so consider your materials, um, your wall linings and things, because um, they get trashed, basically. Um, another one we've got is hospital beds now in the rooms. Again, with the fire compliance, what, what um, has happened along the way, we've put in um, over years um, <coughs> sliding doors and things off the bedrooms, but... You can't actually get a hospital bed out of a bedroom, even with a sliding door. Um, we, we require to, in our evacuation plans, to be able to evacuation out everybody out in three minutes. So it just really can, probably what you're talking about, being intentional, who is your client base, and is the intention to have them aging in place or being there or being prepared to swap them in or out.
Anything else? Well, I think very good discussion. It's great, again, to, to hear the experiences from the room. And if you would join me in, in thanking both Ratnesh and Bev for, for the presentations.